Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to pause for a bit as um, we welcome everyone into the webinar today. My name is Noemi Guevara and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement here at California State University, Long Beach. Thank you for joining us for our next edition of our 49er Industry Chat. We would like to encourage you to use our Q&A box located below to submit any questions for our guest speaker. And, and as a reminder, our, this session is being recorded and it will live on our website on demand at csulb.edu forward slash alumni. And now it's my honor to um, introduce our guest speaker. Um, Christopher Dunbar is the Principal Director of the Guidance and Control Subdivision at the Aerospace Corporation, a federally funded research and development center headquartered in El Segundo, California. He manages and oversees 145 engineers and technicians along with three laboratories, all focused on providing detailed mission assurance and customer guidance, all advice for the national security space missions, NASA missions, and the growing number of commercial missions. The nature of his work spans a broad scope of activities, ranging from test and experimentation to support customers and programs by establishing specs and standards for the industry, new test design and building processes and practices that all apply across the space enterprise domain. Chris is a subject matter expert in the field of control systems, having worked his entire 40 year career in that field and applying his expertise to electromechanical systems ranging from pipeline research in Alaska, missile guidance systems and attitude determination and control of satellites and small unmanned aerial vehicles. Chris has served on National Visible Failure Review Boards and Investigations and on NASA's Technically Disciplinary Teams, chaired technical sessions at professional conferences, presented and published technical papers, acted as a journal reviewer, and has recently received his first patent for a small, mimicry-inspired, unmanned aerial vehicle. Chris is currently the chair of the CSUOB Electrical Engineering Department Advisory and Dem Development Council. Most importantly, Chris is a two-time graduate of CSUOB with a master's and a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. Hosting today's industry chat, please welcome Christopher Dunbar. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us today. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you again for your time. We're very excited um, to chat with you and get to know a little bit about you and your career today. So to kick us off, um, I was hoping we could start at the beginning, you know, your time as, as a student. Um, what made you come to Long Beach State? And if you could share a little bit of your experience with us. Yes, I, I'd be happy to. Um... First of all, let me say that I am a Long Beach native, uh, born and raised, um, grew up in the neighborhood right across the street from the university, just, uh, what is it, um, south of 7th Street um, okay. and on, on that end of campus. So uh, my neighborhood was filled with professors that all taught at the university. Um, my next door neighbor taught in the music department. Um, the gentleman down the street was the head track coach in the, the stadium at uh, uh, on the lower campus. The track stadium is named after him, Dr. Jack Rose. He was a neighbor of mine. So I, I, I sort of grew up in the shadow of the university. So um, having gone to elementary school, high school, um, it made a lot of sense for me to go to CSU Long Beach. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you, as growing up, um, I also saw the university transform because when I was a kid, it wasn't a university. Um, it was California State College. College. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it was, I remember the small footprint that it had, even as a kid, you know, riding my bike around campus and doing the things the kids do. Um, and so I really watched it grow literally firsthand. It, it was before we had the pyramid and many of the current buildings that we have. <laughs> well, yeah, the pyramid, to be honest with you, is actually um, semi-new to me because when I graduated, if you look, it was 1981, 
1986. And I don't think the pyramid was there even in 1986, if I remember correctly. Right. So I know, um, kind of looking, to do, I did some research before to just um, have some questions lined up, but um, were there any mentors? I, I know you live locally, so you probably commuted. Were you part of any student orgs um, when you were a student? Well, well yes. Um, so um, I, like a lot of students, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. So my first semester, I started out as a music major um, because I play uh, you know, uh, other instruments and I thought I wanted to be a musician. But after one semester of that, I changed over to engineering, but I wasn't quite sure which disciplines to change into. So I just declared general engineering. And then um, I started to take classes as all engineering students do under, with undergrad. And you start to find the classes that you like and you find the ones that maybe you're really good at and the, um, the ones that maybe you don't care for so much. And uh, that led me to um, electrical engineering. Um, and then specifically when I got into electrical engineering, I had a class that changed my life, which was uh, EE370. I still remember it. It was control systems. And um, uh, it just came natural to me. Everything about it, the theory, the practicality, everything. So at that point, um, I started to really take every core class I could in that particular discipline. And I still practice that today. That's where I'm a subject matter expert. As far as joining things, the environment back then was not the way the environment is now. There are a lot of student clubs now. I, I know these things because I do a lot of uh, university outreach with my company. Um, and I'm aware of all the clubs and opportunities and, and, and programs within the College of Engineering like BEST which help uh, students that uh, want to go into engineering, but perhaps haven't been particularly strong in the classes that you need in high school to uh, um, excel in engineering. So I'm familiar with, and I'm thinking, boy, I wish I had that when I was going to school there as an undergrad. Um, uh, I had, um, yes, I had mentors at, 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 at CSU Long Beach and a couple of particular professors. I tend to gravitate towards the really, um, maybe the professors that other students don't care for. <laughs> I don't know how to, <laughs> the, the toughest professors. And I, it, it's been my experience in life that sometimes the most crusty um, personalities, once you are often the ones that are the best mentors and all, often have the deepest knowledge of whatever, whatever it is you're seeking. And that certainly was my experience with a couple professors as an undergraduate at, at CSULB. <laughs> Um, and one of those was um, um, Dr. Ray Stefani, who's now Professor Emeritus in the College of Engineering. Um, he was a control systems expert. Um, he was my thesis advisor when I became a graduate student. And uh, he was definitely a big mentor to me as I moved through school as an undergraduate and both as a graduate student. Yes. Wonderful. And you do stress, you know, make those connections and network and get to know your professors, you know, while you're there. Absolutely. I mean, if there was one message that everybody on the call today takes away, especially if you're a, a current student, is, you know, with the campus being what it is, which is, it's a commuter school, very few people live on campus. Um, there's a tendency to sort of take your classes, you know, to get in, get out, you know, and there's that tendency not to go to office hours, not to stick around after class, and get to know your professor. And you gotta remember that they're, they're, they're working through many, many, many students in a day. And it's so easy to, to be a number and not a person. And where you get the mentoring is in those office hours where you're sitting down with the professor, you're getting to know what his likes and dislikes are. You're getting to know what his background is, what his, what his academic progress was coming through school, where he mm -hmm. went to school. Um, and it's those things that lead to so many other opportunities through other networks and uh, um, opportunities that they can help you identify while you're a student. Yeah, wonderful. So now you're finishing your undergrad. Um, how did you put in the door and earn your first professional engineering role? Um, was that through networking or through an internship? Um, okay, so I'm going to give you a so I never was an intern. I never had an engineering intern job because I mentioned that I was a musician. 
Um, mm -hmm. I actually played in bands all the way through uh, college. So no, I never had an internship. But um, my first job, and I, I need to set the stage for this because it's so different than today's economy. When I graduated in May of 1981, we were in the middle of, there was lots of inflation. Um, there, the, the economy was not doing particularly well. So it was not uncommon um, when you were interviewing on campus to have 15, 16, 17 different interviews because everybody was desperately, you know, sort of looking for jobs at that time. However, engineering was booming at that time. So engineering was probably the outlier. And I must have interviewed with 20 different companies. I mean, it was, a, I, I really took advantage of every opportunity that I could get. I also took advantage of some of the services that the university provided, like mock interviews, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, despite the fact you always think you're a good communicator, it's always good for a third party to tell you, no, you need to improve here. Here's how you come across, you know, because that's the first impression that an employer has. And I would strongly encourage students on the call to take advantage of those services, which are still offered. I know they are. Um, and to get a lot of um, feedback from your professors and colleagues and people you know in the industry with your resume. Because as somebody who hires a lot of people now, you know, we have stacks of resumes. And, yeah. you know, so you're looking for discriminators. And you start usually sometimes with GPA but it doesn't end with GPA because GPA is not the end of the story. You know, you're looking for the whole individual. You know, you're looking for people in their personalities because it's important. What do you do in the outside, on the outside? You know, how curious are you about things? Because part of engineering is being curious and seeing where your curiosity takes you. So you're looking for the whole individual. So my, my, my two things that I would sort of focus on are mock interviews and make sure that you get that practice practice makes perfect and and really honing your resume that's the big thing yeah like yesterday we had a previous chat and um our host also said you know the importance of that cover letter so many times people apply for positions and don't have a cover letter and that's so important you know to tell that your story in that yeah, that ought to, uh, that's very important cover letter. And I should have mentioned this too. On your resume, especially now with all the um, um, tech that we have available to us, drop a link on your resume and make sure that um, it's on there to anything that you may have done as a student. So especially if you participated in, for example, the beach launch activities where they build rockets and launch them. If you're a member of a club that builds prototypes and delivers things, if you've done something for a student project and you were part of a team, and I know all this goes on in the College of Engineering, so almost every student will have this, um, put those as videos if, you, if you've uh, uploaded them to YouTube or if you have a channel there, mm -hmm. because employers look at that. We look to see um, not only what kind of grades you got and what kind of you know, classes you took, but how did you participate in a team atmosphere and what role did you play in that team atmosphere? Because when you get into the workplace, very few jobs are just you sitting alone in, a, in an office with the door closed. You are interacting with people all day and you're talking to, to business people, you're talking to other engineers of other disciplines, you're talking to management, you're talking to techs, you're talking, you know, it, it, the variety is, um, is huge, much, much larger than when you're in school. And you have to context switch between all those as part of your daily job, especially if you're effective. Wonderful. So I know that, so you went into the working world with your first role, and then two years after you, you went for your master's, what made you decide to pursue the master's degree? Um, my first job was in the petrochemical industry. Um, and that means you, at the time, you would build things like nuclear reactors, um, large scale uh, civil engineering projects like bridges and industrial plants and pipelines. So my first job was with the company um, Fleur. Um, they were just Fleur then, now they're Fleur Daniel, um, which is a massive international company with offices all around the world. And um, again, my theme was control systems. I love control, so I hired into the control systems department. 
And I thought I was going to be working in that beautiful building that you've all seen where the 405 and the five come together. Um, and it looks like a Pentagon. It's a big building mm -hmm. that used to be floor internationals, uh, headquarters. They've since moved a little bit farther South, but I hired into that company at that time when that building was fairly new. And I thought I was going to be working in there. Well, the first thing I learned is when you, sh you show up, sometimes things dramatically change. And so, um, I was asked if I wanted to work in Alaska. And most of the people at Floor, at some point in their career, work abroad. And so my first assignment was in Alaska. I got to spend almost a year in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is up in the Arctic. Now, as a um, native Southern Californian, at that point in my life, I had never even seen snow. I had never been on a plane. So my very first business trip was getting on you know, a plane, flying up to Fairbanks, Alaska, setting foot in October, I think it was October of 1981. And the, the, the temperature was dropping dramatically. It was still the fall, but it was, it was already like 30 degrees. Well, pretty soon by the, the, the winter, it was way below zero. So the coldest I ever saw when I was there was 40 below zero. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a tremendous learning experience working on the pipeline. I, I had an opportunity to do research and development at Floor on the pipeline. Um, the pipeline was different than the one that exists right now that many people are familiar with. The pipeline that exists now is a natural gas pipeline. I'm sorry, is a crude oil pipeline. And the one that I was working on was to be a natural gas pipeline. And the one that exists that was built in the 1970s before my time um, is above ground. And you'll see pictures of it. And the reason they put it above ground, it's really hard to put things in the ground in the Arctic region because there's a phenomenon called frost heave. Well, the control system that I worked on doing R&D was to simulate frost heave so that we could do life testing for the proposed pipeline that was going to be built. And unfortunately, our research that we did um, showed that any pipe designs that they'd, they'd come up with at that point in time would not meet the 30-year design life. So the project was canceled. It was like a multi-billion dollar project, and it was canceled due to the research that we had done. So when that project concluded, I came back to the home office down in Irvine and they put me on another project and I didn't much care for that project. It wasn't as fun as and exciting as the R&D that I'd done. So um, I asked them if I could go to grad school. And um, at that time, their budgets were a little bit limited. So it was a little bit hard for me to go to grad school. And um, so I thought, well, I'll try my, my, my uh, chances with perhaps another company. And that led me to Northrop back when it was just Northrop before it was Northrop Grumman, which it is now. And uh, Northrop said, absolutely, we will pay for your, your master's degree. So um, uh, I got my master's degree at, at CSULB by Northrop paying for my tuition. And that was a wonderful experience. And I'm very, very thankful for what they, what they did for me. That's wonderful. That's so many, sometimes many companies are, you know, willing to invest in their employees and pay for their that continuing education? I, I think um, my experience has been in all companies I've worked for, they have all supported continuing education. It's just that sometimes budgets vary. And mm -hmm. at my point, I just happened to catch Fleur where their budget didn't, didn't have the, uh, uh, you know, the money in it at the time to, to, to do that for me. Um, but then, um, you know, five or six years at Northrop, I finished my, my um, graduate degree and I worked full time when I was getting my graduate degree. So mm -hmm. I like Long Beach States, um, uh, you can take classes at night. So I worked mm -hmm. during the day, went to classes at night, took me a little bit longer than, you know, if you're going full-time, a master's degree should take you about a year. It took me, I think two years to get through the program taking like one class at a time or two classes at a time. But I worked my way through and then what was very, very nice. And again, very, very lucky to have this happen to me. Um, I was working on an extremely interesting project at work, and I was able to take some of the academic background that I was learning in my grad program and apply it to my work. And I was actually solving a big production line problem, um, which we were having at the time on a guidance system that was going into a nuclear ICBM. And um, I was working an automated test. And automated test is so you could push the products as they're built at a faster rate through the production line. And there was one particular uh, workstation in the assembly process that was the bottleneck. And it was literally holding up the entire pr production line. Well, um, 
the research that I did, which turned into my master's thesis for CSU Long Beach, solved that problem. So not only did I get an award from Northrop for solving the problem, but I got to write a really interesting thesis for my master's thesis, which I got an award for that too. So boy, did mm -hmm. I did I milk that topic for everything it was worth. <laughs> That's wonder that applying you know what you're researching and doing into your 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 job is is wonderful. Um, I start to get questions from our our audience. Um, I have a question here. How did electrical engineering play a role in the R and D you worked on for the natural gas pipeline? That's an excellent question. Um, Electrical engineering at first thought is, is you're, learning, you're, you're learning about how to design circuits or you're learning how to um, build antennas and transmission lines and things like that. So things that generally aren't mechanical because it's electrical. Well, mm -hmm. um, the very first thing that I did is I learned circuit design. And then as I took control systems classes, I was able to apply controls design to circuit cards. So things like phase lock loops and, and things like that. So my very first control system that I ever designed was actually a circuit card and it was a thermal control system that was part of a large mechanical device, um, what they call electromechanical. It was an electromechanical servo, servo system which simulated the frost heave that I mentioned earlier that we were trying to simulate for R&D. So my electrical engineering skills of circuit design resulted in a control system that was on a circuit card that got put into a mechanical system, if that makes sense. Okay. Wonderful. Um, currently you work for the Aerospace um, Corporation. Um, it's a fairly funded research and development center. What does that mean and how does it differ from working for them versus other engineering firms? That is a great question and a question that I get often when I do recruiting is, boy, we've never heard of the Aerospace Corporation and what is a federally funded research and development center? Well, if you go on Wikipedia and you look up FFRDC, they have a great posting, which will explain all of that to you. But FFRDCs were created, in, I think, in, uh, in the midst of World War II. And the government was trying to figure out ways to accelerate what was going on in academia and in various laboratories around the company, uh, country, I should say, and to help accelerate you know, technology development that they were trying to use during World War II. So the very first example that I think most people understand is the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, out in mm -hmm. Pasadena. They are an FFRDC as well. So the rocketry that was going on at Caltech at the time in the laboratories there during the uh, 1930s and 40s during World War II um, resulted in the government standing up an FFRDC. And what the FFRDCs do, they are different than working at contractors. Contractors are companies like uh, Boeing, at least in the, um, the aerospace industry, uh, Boeing, Raytheon, uh, Lockheed Martin, SpaceX, those are contractors. So what happens is the government has a need they put out an RFP, which is a request for proposal. The contractors respond to that proposal based on requirements in the proposal. And the government has uh, several choices based on how many people apply, how many companies apply. And then there's a down selection process from the many that apply to the ones that get the contract. Where aerospace plays is, is we are the national security space, FFRDC for national security space. So everything that goes on space, in space, with respect to the United States government, aerospace is involved in every program. So those down selects that I mentioned, sometimes we will help write the requirements for the RFPs. Mm -hmm. We will help the government make a selection because we'll be part of a, an evaluation team. We also support the programs once the programs are put on contract. And then we work all through the life cycle from the start of the program through an RFP all the way through its end of life and they decommission the project. So the variety that exists at aerospace is vastly different than you would get at a contractor because at a contractor, you're subject to the ones, the contracts that you've won and you've, you've also lost contracts. And that means that you, know, you don't get to work those contracts you didn't win. So um, 
On the other hand, at aerospace, we work all those contracts. So the variety is much different. And I think that takes me to a second point I'd like to make about maybe a differentiator for aerospace. Um, variety is, is good, but some people don't like so much variety. Um, and I like to call it plate spinning. You know, if you're familiar with the idea of you got a stick and a plate and you got to spin it on there, it's like an acrobatic mm -hmm. thing. But time management is absolutely crucial in how I spend my day, even from the first day I was at aerospace to where I'm at now. Because most engineers work two, three, four different projects. And on each of those projects, your role can be completely different. In one project, you're leading. Another project, you're just a team member. Another project, you might be have a very minimal role. And all those projects have different managers. And all those projects have different teams. So your ability to work effectively, back to the point I was making earlier, with a variety of skills, disciplines, people, and personalities is crucial to success. And, and, and the um, experience that I had at my two prior employers was much more limited in capacity in terms of what I do now at aerospace. Um, my, my eight, nine hours at a minimum flies by because every day is a new day. I never experienced the same day twice. Right. And that was going to be lead into my next question. Like, what does your day to day look like? Yes, um, my day to day starts out where I meet with my staff. First thing Monday morning, eight o'clock Monday morning, and we do a, a week look ahead. You know, what's on the agenda for the next five days? And we work through that. And there's always conflicts. There's always um, scheduling and calendaring things that need to be deconflicted. And then I usually start jumping into the technical. Now, prior to COVID, um, my day was spent largely outside of my office. I spend maybe two hours in my office in a given day. And what I'm usually doing is moving through my laboratories. I have three laboratories, um, checking in on progress on some of the tests and experimentation that we're doing and some of the concept development that we, we're, we're doing in our labs. And then I spend a lot of it with my customers. My customers are internal aerospace people that are customer facing. So customers could be the Space Force, it could be the Air Force, it could be the intelligence community, it could be um, NASA. I spend an awful lot of time with NASA because we do a lot of uh, you know, work that we co-sponsor. And um, those are my customers. And I need to be in tune with what they need and want because at the end of the day, in running an engineering organization, I am providing services. I'm providing people and manpower to support those projects. So it's, it's a very day, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, the meeting that you just got out of has nothing to do with the next meeting you go into. So you're always context switching, which, which I personally love. It keeps you on your feet and you know, nimble. Definitely. That leads into my other question. I know I mean, now you're part of that management team and managing a huge amount of people. Like, is there anything you miss from the technical or the engineering work but you're kind of answered my question when saying you go out in the field, you still go out in the field and do minimal in the office now. Yes. Um, when you st first start your career, largely, you know, you're going to be working on a project and you're going to be applying those skills that you learned at CSU Long Beach. And um, the, the big thing I would say is you want to become an expert at something. And, and I think depending on where your varied interests are, some people like to become a narrow and deep expert. Other people like to become um, um, uh, an, an expert in a field, but also very broad so, so they can work across a lot of dis disciplines. In engineering, we call that good systems engineering. And um, I chose the latter path, systems engineering. So while I'm a subject matter expert at controls, and have done many different controls designs on various projects, at some point, I started to take the broader view of how does the control system fit into the larger scheme of things. And then that led me into things like thermal, power, um, uh, solar panels, things, other things that are non-control um, systems related. And then that means you're working interdisciplinary across teams. You're working with engineers that don't maybe perhaps even speak the same language as you do. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean English, I mean engineering, because In sometimes language, yeah. we talk past each other. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Believe me, engineers have a tendency to talk past each other in terms of jargon and acronyms. And <clears throat> you think you know what you're talking to somebody about. And it turns out the acronym that you use is the same as theirs, but it means something different. Um, and, you know, communication, I can't say it enough, is so, so important for engineering and being a good communicator. Because if you look at some of the problems that we've had, and I'll point to one that's everybody can relate to is um, happened maybe seven, eight, nine years ago where NASA uh, launched a spacecraft and it was supposed to land on another planet and it crashed. And the reason it crashed is because one set of the team was using English units, things like feet, inches, miles, um, pounds. And the other part of the team was using metric, you know, millimeters, kilograms, and the two are not the same. There's a conversion factor. And so if your flight software is in one system and your hardware is in another, bad things happen. And that was clearly a communication issue. If you look at the Challenger accident with the space shuttle, that was clearly a communication engine, you know, issue. It was not a technical problem. It was, it was engineers not talking to engineers and decisions not, not being made with the full amount of data available to them because of a lack of communication. And um, that I can't stress enough for people considering an engineering career. If you thought you were gonna be working in an office by yourself because you don't, you know, you don't wanna be talking to people all day, you're gonna be talking to people all day in addition to working in front of your computer in a laboratory. And that's a real misconception, you know, that, that people have, like, I just want to be on my own space. And that leads into a question that was submitted, you know, as a hiring manager, what are soft skills you're looking for? As a student, I worry about my presenting and communication skills. What advice do you have around this? Absolutely. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Again, I think I mentioned the holistic view at the individual. So we're looking at we're looking at you to have you know a skill set that is relatable to the work we're going to do. Now, do you have to be be the best in your class? No, you don't have to be. But if if you if you are the top in your class in terms of doing the homework and passing the exams, and you're a poor presenter and a poor speaker, that will be a problem, because a lot of what we do is presenting our work as part of design reviews to customers that want to know that you are going to build them the best possible program that meets their requirements. And if you can't convey that you've done your job right, then there's going to be many, many questions asked of you real time in a meeting in front of a lot of people and your ability to think on your feet and answer questions effectively with a clear and concise uh, communication style. Is, is absolutely part of being an engineer in industry, no matter what industry you work in. So I would strongly recommend to that student that asked that question, please work with your professors, your, your undergraduate advisor or your graduate advisor, or some of the soft skills that you can take classes in that are down in, um, I forget what building it is on lower campus that teaches you those things. But presentation skills, um, if you're part of a student team, a student project, and you're thinking, hey, I know how to build this thing, but I don't wanna be the guy that's presenting. And I know there's a lot of you out there that like that. Mm -hmm. They want somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the person who's the team lead, the one who's making the presentation, the one that coordinated, the one that prioritized the work, the one that got the students that weren't pulling their weight, you know, motivating them. Those are the kind of student leaders that I'm looking for in addition to being a good student. Wonderful, great advice, thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, what factors influence your decision to transition from natural gas and R&D to aerospace? And what's the most rewarding part of working in aerospace? Well, there's, there's two ways to say aerospace. There's the aerospace industry, and then there's aerospace, the company. So I'll start with aerospace, the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't start out in the aerospace industry. I, I did not, I, I thought I'd try something different. A lot of people at electrical engineering go into the aerospace industry right out of school because um, there's a lot of jobs, but I wanted to try something different. So I tried the petrochemical industry. And then um, I moved in the, into the defense industry where the primary customer was the Department of Defense. That was when I was at Northrop. And um, so still not really in the, in the space industry, still not really, I'm working on a rocket, but, but it's not a satellite. And 
What led me to the aerospace industry and ultimately to aerospace corporation was the perception that I had heard through friends and networks, and this gets back to the issue of networks yet again, mm -hmm. is a lot of the hard classes that you took where you learn things you think, I'm never going to use this. You know, many of us have been in classes like that. No, mm -hmm. I don't need to know this because we're never going to use it. Those really hard classes, I had heard that the aerospace industry often made use of those classes, those upper division classes, those, um, those graduate level classes. And that was sort of like rumor mill amongst friends that I knew that were working at other companies. And um, lo and behold, when I started working in the aerospace industry for Aerospace Corporation, boy, were they right. I was doing calculus and writing differential equations and writing code um, from day one, the minute I, left, I, I entered Aerospace Corporation. And I said, my gosh, boy, am I glad I have the academic background that I have because otherwise I'd be at a, at a loss. And at some of my prior jobs, I didn't need those classes quite so much. Um, but at aerospace, I did. And um, the other thing was the variety of classes that I took. Um, I, even, um, I even took logic classes in the philosophy department, not the College of Engineering, because it, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I took five years to graduate back then in 1981. And it was because I, I enjoyed taking classes outside the College of Engineering. And one of those classes was philosophy. And, and in philosophy, they have logic. Well, guess what? As an engineer, you use logic every day, you know, flow diagrams. If, you, if this, then this, then that, then that. Or if you're working anomaly investigations where something bad has happened and they're doing an investigation, you're using logic all the time. And boy, am I glad I took that philosophy class so many years ago in the philosophy department. So sometimes I think there's a, there's a, there's a tendency try to get in and out of school, you know, to get that piece of paper, get a job. But sometimes if you do that, you're missing out on all the opportunities that are around you to, to kind of well-round yourself. So, you know, if, if someone, if an employer asks you, well, gosh, it took you five years to graduate instead of four, which is, you know, quote the norm. Um, uh, tell me about that. Well, then you have a story to tell. If you, you, you know, your curiosity took you towards other classes towards more GE classes. I know one of the things that I don't like about the curriculum today in the College of Engineering is the de-emphasis of general ed. Um, that there's not a many, as many GE classes to take anymore, which that means we're graduating engineers that are much more narrow and they don't have that broad experience in terms of these other classes that I'm mentioning, like, like logic. Um, and um, so anyway, I'll stop there, but that's what led me um, to, um, to aerospace was, again, the curiosity about what's going on in space. And I do think that leads us to the present moment. Um, for those of you that are graduating or coming close to graduating, mm -hmm. I wanted to make a point here. Um, and I wish that it happened 30 years earlier in my career. Right, what's going on right now is a space revolution. It's the biggest space revolution we've had since the 1960s. You know, if you all recall, um, and you probably read about it in history books, 1958, the Russians lost, launched Sputnik and the, and the United States panicked because we did not have a space program at that time. It's like, oh my gosh, the Russians are ahead of us. Um, and then that led to President Kennedy in 1961 laying down the challenge that by the end of the decade, he wanted a man on the moon. Well, lo and behold, we put a man on the moon in 1969. So we met that goal. And that was a huge revolution that occurred over about a 10 year period where STEM became really imp important, science, technology, engineering, and math. Then in the 1970s, we kind of lost the recipe. Um, frankly, um, STEM was not, what's the word, uh, made prevalent, put into the forefront. In the forefront of things, yeah. Yeah, you just didn't hear about it. So a lot of students didn't go into science and engineering and math. Now, a lot of people my age are at the end of their careers and we need that pipeline to be filled um, because a lot of people are gonna be retiring with all the skills and experience. And so engineering as a career, not only does it pay very well, but there are job opportunities galore because there's something called commercial space that's emerging. And that's the idea that companies like SpaceX, um, Virgin Galactic, uh, those sorts of companies that didn't exist, you know, 15, 20 years ago are doing new things in space that have never been done before. 
and they're ta- they're starting to talk about space tourism, you know, where mm-hmm. somebody can get and pay for a ticket and be taken to outer space. And prices are astronomical right now, but as is true of everything, the prices will drop. So I, I, I expect many of the people on this call will get the opportunity to take a ride into space at some point in their life, because that's where we're going. And we want to get to Mars. We want to get to Mars in, in the next decade. And um, there's tremendous technological problems that need to be solved. Many of them re- you know, that are related to hardware, but many of them related to how do you train people to operate and live in an environment like Mars. And so you know, NASA and aerospace were working together to uh, figure those sorts of things out with um, human spaceflight. And there's the safety issue, of course, which we want to make sure we're, we're, we're keeping them safe. Um, so you guys are in the midst of a revolution. And if you're not aware of it, jobs are plentiful. Um, everybody is hiring. Everybody needs more talented people on their, on their not just aerospace corporation, but everybody. Um, so uh, it's really um, a once in a lifetime opportunity to seize the moment. Yeah, definitely. Um, with the evolution of technology, like you just mentioned, engineering, um, regulatory systems, how do you stay sharp as a subject matter expert and how do you keep learning? So at, at my company now, every employee has to show that they're taking a certain amount of classes a year. And I, for one, always, you know, overachieve in that regard. Um, we have something called the Aerospace University, which uh, many of our employees teach at universities on the side. And many of them teach at CSU Long Beach, um, you know, part-time. They're not a full tenured professor, but they te- teach part-time in their, in their sure. uh, subject matter expertise. And because we have that wealth of talent, we teach our employees. So I can take classes that if, I, if I've forgotten something that I had 30 years ago, I need to bone up on. I can take a class in that at work and we keep track of those um, and we encourage employees for continuous learning all year long. Um, and uh, that's every year, that's part of their performance review. So you have to keep uh-huh. taking classes. That's an expectation from everybody that's the uh, lowest on the org chart all the way up to our vice presidents uh, take classes every year to stay, to stay fresh. The second part of that um, with respect, with respect to regulations and policy. Aerospace has um, an organization called CSPS, which, um, um, which is our policy organization. So we help establish s- space policy. And that means we advise the government on what they should be doing and s- help steer them through all the decisions that they need to make as, as thought leaders. Um, and we help, have to help establish policy. And I'll tell you one policy that everybody's really, really familiar with, whether they know it or not a lot or know it or not. And that is up until just recently, we had something like several hundred pieces of objects in, in, in space, you know, that have been there since 1960 and beyond from any country. And when you go into space, there's two things that can happen. When you're at your end of mission, you deorbit the vehicle and it burns up in the atmosphere. So it never, never hits the ground, it just burns up. And the other ones that are in higher orbits remain there forever. They become space junk. And what happens with junk of any kind if you don't do anything about it? It accumulates. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens if you have stuff that's gonna be there for infinity and you start launching more and more regularly and adding more to the uh, list of assets where well, you start to see what they call proliferation of satellites. And that's, the, that's where we're at right now. A lot of companies are building um, a, a lot of satellites to do global coverage for uh, internet, for example, or um, um, streaming video to your house, to any, you know, any nation in the world, to any house in the world. Right now, it doesn't matter where you live. Um, that's, right now, it depends where you live, if you've got those services or not. And of course, that leads to a problem. How do you coordinate that? How do you reach treaties? And often, um, the technology outpaces the policy. And that's sort of the world in which we live right now where the technology is well in advance of the policies. And and we at Aerospace are trying to close that loop. And if you guys are interested, please go to www.aerospace.org, which is our website, and look up our space policies. What we do is we put out white papers, which are are there for the public to view 
so you could view some of the things that we are um, discussing and working with thought leadership on how to regulate and establish policies around. It's, 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 there's a wealth of material there and please check it out. Wonderful. So I know we're up against time, but I have two more questions I really wanna ask. You mentioned having a patent. What is that, what is that for and what was your process to get there? Uh, thank you for asking. I'm very proud to uh, discuss that. Um, um, everybody is familiar with the small drones that you could buy, you know, um, that are like uh, DJI phantoms that you see people flying in a park or the beach. Um, they're almost hobbyist quality. And um, the things that people use them most for are you, you could put a camera on the bottom of them. You could fly around. You could take pictures, you know, of fireworks shows or weddings or, um, you know, whales offshore. If you've ever done whale uh, watching, they use those in whale watching now. But boy, you can do so much more science with those than that sort of thing. So one of the things that I got involved in is I hired um, a student from the University of Maryland who had just got his PhD and his background was in biomimicry. And biomimicry is the science, it's, it's the soft science of understanding that nature has, has solved many of engineering's hardest problems already. And we just have to understand what nature has already showed us. So um, this, per, this person um, got his PhD and his thesis around something that was based on a winged seed. It was a maple seed. And if you look at a pine cone, everybody's familiar with pine cone here on the West Coast, mm -hmm. it's big and heavy. And when the pine cone falls to the ground, all the seeds are in the pine cone and guess what happens? Another you know, pine tree grows right where the pine cone fell. So pine trees tend to be in clumps in very dense forest areas. But on the East Coast where maples, maple trees are more prevalent, a wing seed is advantageous because the wind can carry it vast distances before it hits the ground. So you get the proliferation of pine trees, I'm sorry, of uh, maple trees over wide areas. Well, anyway, he got the idea to start building a helicopter, sort of a combination between a helicopter and a fixed wing aircraft, and it spins. So when he, he got his master, his, when he got his uh, PhD, um, he hired at aerospace. He did a demo for us of his PhD thesis. And on, when I saw that, the wheels in my head started turning. I could see all sorts of things we could do with that. So what we did is we took his, um, when we hired him, as we did, um, we, we added a couple wings and a couple more engines to it. And we turned it into something called AeroSeed, um, A-E-R-O-S-E-E-D. It's built on the maple seed biomimicry inspired, inspired UAV. And um, it's unique aircraft. It spins 20 times a second. Um, it's hard to see. It's very quiet. It's very nimble. It's very fast. It's agile. And then that led to the patent that we got on it. Now the patent process, um, every engineer wants to hold a patent at some point in time. And for me, it took decades to get to that point because I just never had the time to actually get involved in the technical work. But when I saw this technology, that was something I wanted to make time for. So we spent time on it, developing it. And you file with an attorney. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole process because that would take another half an hour. But mm -hmm. it's an arduous process where you, you sit down with an attorney. As an engineer, you have to explain to someone who is a legal expert engineering principles. And that gets back to communication. So you draw up artwork. You, you, you explain you talk, you present, the, 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 the attorney absorbs that material, then files a patent at the United States Patent Office. And then the next part begins, which they look around to see if there are adjacent patents. If, are you basically duplicating somebody else's work? Are, are you first of a kind? And sometimes that's where the process will end. Yes, your idea, which you thought was novel, is not so novel because other people have done that. And that whole patent exploration process, which the attorney is involved in, um, unveils that. And they will tell you, nope, it looks like you've, 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 hit, you've you know, hit on something that somebody else has done. In the case of, of our work, we had to make several arguments um, that our work was novel with respect to what the attorney thought was um, adjacent um, um, intellectual property. And after a ba back and forth over so a period of six or seven months, we got through that process and then mm -hmm. you file the paperwork and then that becomes kind of workflow. And then maybe a year or so after that, you get a notice and you get a patent 
and you get a little plaque on your wall that you can have you can you can hang on your wall put on your cv your resume and uh publish papers which is what i've done wonderful what a great journey and that's amazing congratulations i'll ask one more question or two more questions and then um what what you mentioned um ee370 one of our students asked what about ee370 that attracted you and then two um any concluding remarks you want to leave our audience with today okay um all right i'll take that in two parts and please remind me if i forget the second part because i'm asking okay. that but um with 370, at that point, a lot of engineering had been sort of abstract to me. It was, it was, I, nothing, it was nothing tangible. But back then, they had a 370 class, which was the intro, introduction to control systems. And you learn all the theory behind it. But they also had a laboratory, the 370 lab. And there you got to go in hands-on and build control systems. And that's the first time I ever had one of those eureka moments where it's like, Oh, I, now I get how my class applies to this particular project. And that's what set me off. That's what I love. That's why I remember 370 to this day. That was the only class that I had that had that kind of eureka moment for me, which of course I, I'm someone who loves control systems. And it was very relatable because all of a sudden your whole life, you hear people talk about, oh, you need to give somebody feedback. You need to give somebody, what do they mean by that? Well, most people understand verbal feedback. But what do you mean by control systems feedback? Well, I started thinking about it and I thought, oh, I know what a control systems is in my house. It's staring me in the face. It's my thermostat that we adjust for either air conditioning or heating. That's a control system. And then I started to say, oh, okay, I get it. There's thermal control systems. There's electrical control systems. There's power plant control systems. There's satellite control systems. The world is full of control systems around us. Even you, when you're driving a car, your autopilot that's in a Tesla, that's a control system. Mm -hmm. um, the computer is driving. It's replacing the human in the loop because when you're driving your car, you're part of the control system. Your eyes are the sensors. Your feet are the actuators on the brakes. Your, your hands on the wheel are, are changing it. You're part of the control system. And most people don't even realize that. Um, and so to me, I started to see the relevancy of control systems in the world at large, just by taking that one class. And then there was a second part to the question. And then the last, any um, final remarks you'd like to leave our, our students and our, our alums with? Yes. Um, you are going to a, a university that is an accredited university. It is a very good university. It is a diverse university. It is a, it's got a lot of research going on. And if you don't know your university is doing research and you're in the engineering department, that means you haven't made a connection to one of your professors and the research that they're doing. So this goes back to my advice at the very beginning, which is to get to know your professors, either in off, off hours or um, office hours. Um, and you're gonna get involved in all sorts of activities that you otherwise wouldn't have if you hadn't reached out. And then that's going to develop your network. And I kept coming back to this theme of communication and the soft skills being absolutely necessary to, to have a successful and challenging engineering career. Absolutely. If you've got some weaknesses and everybody's got them, you might be the most brilliant person in your class, but you must, might be the worst presenter. You need to, you need to level those two out and, and, get the, and develop those skills. And the university offers classes and skills and workshops to help you with those. And make sure you avail yourself of everything that the university offers. And the, maybe one last thing I wanted to make um, note of that is, is a little disturbing that more people don't know about this um, is industry is on site all the time on your campus. We're, we're recruiting. Yes, you'll see the banners and you'll see the collections of resumes, but that's not what I'm talking about. We are on site all the time and we are partnering with your university, with your professors, to do work that helps you with your capstone project, or it might even lead to your thesis for your master's degree. That is the best possible experience you can get. And I don't see enough students partaking in that. I see the same students over and over again, the, the lucky few. And I think you really need to make sure that you're being made aware of the opportunities that are around you. So please join the student clubs. And there's a multitude of them. 
If you've got a high GPA, be a part of your honorary society. I was a member of Ada Kappa Nu, which is the Electrical Engineering Honor Society. So I did things with them that led to other net networking opportunities. You got to make sure that when by the time you graduate, you've part partaken of all those, all those opportunities. Otherwise, you've missed out. And there's probably some holes, in, not only in your resume, but also your skill set that you're going to probably need to fix once you get out in the industry. And that'll make you, you know, maybe less desirable than if you if you've done all you know, taking advantage of all of those. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you, Christopher, for um, your chat today and for the great advice you have for our current students. Before we log off today, if anyone wants to connect with you, are you okay if they look for you on LinkedIn um, and try to network with you? Yes, I am on LinkedIn. And uh, please reach out to me through there, or I'll even give you, um, I always enjoy these things. Um, I do enjoy interacting with students. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's not something I'm looking to avoid. So okay. um, my, my email address at work is my first name, Christopher dot Dunbar, my last name, at arrow, A-E-R-O dot O-R-G. So Christopher dot Dunbar at arrow dot org. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your great insight. Congratulations on a stellar career. We're very um, proud to have you as one of our alumnus. Um, and for everyone, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, if you would like to learn about our future chats, please visit our website or follow us on social media to learn about future chats. We thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you.